So hello, everybody. A very warm welcome. My name is Martina Puchberger, and we, the Goethe Institute, are very excited to be presenting about the future in times of crises in collaboration with Super Lab. That is Julia Kleuber and Elisa Lindinger. I'd like to say big thanks to Irini Papadimitriou, Michelle Thorne and John Roger, who assisted on the curatorial side of the event. And of course, to all the speakers of this panel and contributors to the project. Before I hand over to Julia, who will be chairing the event, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. So please feel free to post questions and comments during the discussion and we'll feed them into the open part of the conversation towards the end. The event will be recorded and published on the Goethe Institute's YouTube channel afterwards. Thanks all for tuning in and enjoy the following conversation. Hello, also from my side. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, hello to wherever you're joining us today. My name is Julia Kleuber. I, I'll be moderating this uh, discussion today with the title about the future in times of crisis. I'm very happy to be joined by four panelists. Um, welcome, Joel Kwong. Joel is an independent curator and program director of the Microwave International New Media Arts Festival in Hong Kong. Hello, Joel. I'm also joined by Eric Su. Eric is a new media artist and creative director from Hong Kong based in Tokyo. So Eric is calling in from Tokyo. Hi, Eric. Um, We're also joined by Olya Sosnovskaya, an artist and researcher from Belarus, currently based in Vienna, and Abir Gattas, a Lebanese activist, digital communications specialist, and technologies just based in Berlin. So as you can see, we are a pretty international group for this panel, for this discussion today with lots of expertise and lots of insights. Um, before we start, I want to give you some context on the idea behind this discussion. Together with Irini, with Michelle, John and Elisa, as Martina just mentioned, um, we had this idea for this series earlier this year when the corona pandemic had just started. We felt that the immediacy of the coronavirus has somehow sharpened our understanding of the other crises we face, inequality, authoritarianism, environmental collapse, and more. And while being in the midst of all of these crises, being in the midst of hard times for many of us, we also saw creativity and resilience emerge. We encountered new ways of doing things. We saw how people started to do things in new ways. And even though our instincts might have been saying otherwise, we felt that if there was ever a moment to think about the future, it is now. Things that might have seemed impossible might be possible, but only if we dare to talk about them, articulate them and imagine them. This is also part of what we want to do today in this discussion. This conversation will be continued. We're going to launch a magazine on the 15th of December with contributions from all of the panelists here. But um, more than that, we also have contributions from Venezuela, from Croatia and from India. Before we start, I want to emphasize that um, the topics that we're going to talk about are really complex political and societal issues. And since we have a limited amount of time, we'll of course only be touching upon certain aspects of these topics. And with that in mind, I want to start. I want to take us to Hong Kong um, for uh, our first um, conversation with Cho and with Eric. The whole discussion is structured in a way that we look at the future first and uh, look at the present first and then move into the future. Um, so let's start with Hong Kong. The Hong Kong-based writer and lawyer Anthony DePirian calls Hong Kong the city of protest. Um, I will share a picture with you um, of what these protests looked like um, in 2019 to get us started. So we see this BBC 
um, news that talks about 2 million people demonstrating on the streets uh, of Hong Kong in June 2019. And uh, just for a point of reference, how massive these demonstrations and protests are, Hong Kong has uh, 7.4 million inhabitants. So let's start with um, you, Chol. Um, can you give us a brief overview on what has led to the recent mass protests and maybe also briefly talk about what is different uh, from the protests that we've, uh, we've seen throughout the past two years um, um, compared to the ones we saw in 2014, the umbrella movement, um, where the pictures are also still in our heads, I assume. Thank you, Julia. Uh, nice seeing you guys. This is Joe. Um, first of all, let me give a very brief overview. Um, I guess most of you got the image back to 2014 about the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. By that time, Hong Kong people actually striking for the universal suffrage here because we cannot vote for our chief executive. And then by that time, we have centralized group organizing mass, mass um, protests. And then eventually uh, Occupy Central happened. So you may see a lot of images um, like occupying tents and uh, a lot of people centralized in Central in Hong Kong. It's uh, like uh, Central CBD in Hong Kong out there. And then that image, um, I guess you guys have that. And then it comes to 2019, um, actually it, started in February 2019. It's actually about uh, the counseling discussing about to pass the extradition bill in Hong Kong, which means that a lot of people are concerning about our own independent legal system in Hong Kong last for long. And then a lot of people, Hong Kong citizens with questions. And then that's why um, we got a huge protest on June 9th, which around 1 million people, there's also cover on a lot of international media. Um, and then after that date, actually our chief executive insists to pursue that bill. And that's why it needs to several days afterwards that the image you guys just saw for the uh, 12th June, which over 2 million people on street. Uh, by that time, we actually insist for five demands, five key elements. First of all, it's about the withdrawal of the bill because a lot of people, citizens, got concerned on that. And also during the protests, we encounter a lot of questioning case about police brutality. And that's why the second one is investigation on police brutality and misconduct. And the third, because a lot of citizens are being arrested, especially the frontliners. So the third one is the release of arrested protester. And the fourth one is do not characterize the protest as riots. And then the fifth one is asking our chief executive, Carrie Lam, to step down, to resign, along with the introduction of universal suffrage that people strike on 2014. And then that leads to the picture that you guys saw that. The most, um, or say the biggest difference between the, the protests in 2014 and 2019 is actually by decentralizations. Because back to 2014, we know that we got people organize things with um, the, the Occupy Centrals and making media conferences as well um, to announce to the public. But to 2019 is actually, um, it's actually the voice from the public. So everything happened in all social media and digital means. And then it's very, very decentralized. We don't have an, you know, organized groups for that. So that's why we see the whole thing is so different. We do not have a plan. That's why we use Be Water at the, as the research project's title. And then maybe Eric will explain a lot about that. Yeah, because uh, th thank you, Chil, because you and Eric, uh, the two of you submitted the Be Water movement to Ars Electronica and um, the Hong Kongers, all the protesters were awarded the Golden Nika. So this anonymous um, movement of protesters uh, received this award. And Eric, I would like to, uh, first of all, share uh, some images uh, with you that also that you showed at Ars Electronica and then talk with you about this notion of be water. So what does this mean? Um, what do people mean when they say be water? Can you can you guide us through this a little bit, please? Eric, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, nice to see everyone in this uh, program. And yeah, uh, be water was a very important uh, philosophy uh, in our protest in 2019. Um, basically, as Joey said, like uh, the from we learned from 2014 that like it's very centralized. So uh, we want to have like a more like decentralized and leaderless uh, protest um, in 2019. So that actually it makes the authority very difficult for to trace us to like you know, to stop things because things are just happening very organically and everywhere basically so uh and and after or like how that how this like award uh applying to i mean applying to the arthur Trinka award happens is because uh at a certain point that um me as an artist uh i was thinking that like uh hong kongers protest has also be, been known as a very a creative and you know the innovative one. So uh, by looking at the category of um, of uh, our Sertonica, the digital community, we actually think that like I think that like it's actually describing like how Hong Kongers like do organize this uh, 2019 protest. Therefore, uh, we think that what if we we try to uh, make Hong Kongers re receive this award? It's basically. Uh, to to signify that you know Hong Kongers have this uh, capability, and also it, uh, hoping hoping that this will open up some doors for communication or discussion in the society, particularly in the creative creative scene, creative world. So uh, so that our voice can reach further, and therefore um, therefore we apply it, and then uh, it's quite interesting. Like Ars Electronica, like it is the first time in their in their history that they award um, a, a, a anonymously to a city of people um, this Godonica. So we are very thrilled about it. I mean, I can talk about like the order, but if you want, I just yeah, want to the Maybe what, what does the, because it's a Bruce Lee saying, right? So right, what right, does right. the saying, what does the saying say exactly? Yeah, so Bruce Lee was, uh, yeah, sorry, I missed that, that part. Like, so Bruce Lee is like the martial art stars of Hong Kong. And then he has this philosophy called be water, my friend. Uh, water is shapeless, formless. Uh, water can crash, water can flow. Uh, water, when it is in a grass, uh, it, it, it becomes a grass. When it is in a cup, it becomes a cup. So um, the whole philosophy is about like uh, adopting to situation, keep transforming uh keep uh an organic movement um when you're facing different kind of situation so uh hong kongers adopt this uh situate uh this kind of philosophy it's just basically keep transforming uh not only decentralizing and leaderless but also like keep transforming the strategy like for example like uh they can be protesting in one district uh in the whole afternoon but suddenly they were moving in other place and keep moving keep moving keep moving in the, the other places walk very like they move very organically so like, organically so like the police cannot trace them and and uh, a lot of that a lot of that uh uh it's happened or also by the support of technology because without technology without like digital community in these days uh digital technology in these days that is very hard for for us to organize things like this so uh because a lot of protester uh in this in this protest is actually quite dominated by uh younger people so they're very tech savvy they they understand technology they're very digital native they learn technology very quick and they can they can they can you know utilize to, to get the use of technology very fast so therefore um uh uh with te with technology on the internet information can share information can can distribute like very quickly uh so that we can we can we can respond to situation very fast another another, another example for leaderless uh kind of like uh uh protest protest core also is for example, we have this forum in, in on the on the internet called Li Hong Kong. It's basically a Hong Kong version of Reddit, and it's this also kind of introduced this like um, uh, digital democracy that allowing people to just post their ideas online, 
And you know, if their idea was like and interesting enough, then people would just push and like the idea and go all the way to the top. It's pretty much become like a voting system uh, because when you push all the way to the top, will be more people seeing it. And it's up to people to take that idea to execute or not. And the people and the person who proposed that idea doesn't necessarily to be the person who executed it as well. So one idea spark uh, happened in like this part of the city can spark like in their miles away, something like that. So this organic type of like um, momentum is really you need and in, in has uh, in, in this movement. Thanks, Eric. I remember, Joel, when we talked before, you mentioned that uh, information was shared in new ways and you talked about how information was airdropped to you. So how did this work and, and what type of information is shared among people anonymously? Mm, uh, well, starting from June, actually, a lot of Hong Kongers been to the streets up to join in peaceful protests before. So there are so many news every day, information flow every day. And then sometimes for older generations, they do not get, you know, get it so quickly. And then there are so many people, particularly uh, designers, they do like package of information in short with illustrations with really simple steps to like sort of educate or teach people or lead people how to go through those informations or understand package of news in one day. Uh, but this kind of uh, information pack doesn't only flow on the internet, on social media, but when you're on the streets, you know, airdrop is a very, very simple technology. And somehow you don't even recognize that you've already switched on that. So uh, you may receive this kind of easy to understanding package on streets by anonymous. They just drop to you. And then sometimes it's about the preparations for this Saturday's protest. Sometimes it's about a news um, law may coming and then how we can encounter it or understand the pros and cons about that. So all this information actually being flow uh, not only on social media or within the people in a group of you know friends, but anonymous you know citizens, they share in a really quick pace. Thanks. Let's maybe take a look at some protest art or an exhibition that you shared with me, Joel. I'll share the image. Um, what can we see here? This is an exhibition called Yellow Objects. What does it refer to? Uh, well, um, first of all, I would like to talk about the identity of creative petitioner in the protest. You know, at the very beginning, everybody is very, very confused. Apart from, you know, going on the streets, we actually don't know what to do. So apart from going through all this and go with the float, and then every time when we encounter different kind of media conference from the authorities or some news pops up, we react. And then this yellow object exhibition indeed is a reaction from a group of local designers. And there is a news about a, uh, a question towards police brutality, hitting up people wearing all black uh, and, and yellow vest. And then in that media conference that news that I shared earlier is about the conference they claim that is in yellow object out there so that's why Thanks. by that news yeah by that news a group of you know young designers grouping together to react to that and design 18 poster to do this show to engage the public and also for fundraising afterwards so artists have been very busy throughout the protests we can also uh, Eric shared some some images with me earlier. Um, these are also two protest art images. Um, Eric, one, what can we see on these uh, images? And then also how has protest art changed um, by the um, national security law that came out? Um, Yeah, so these two are like one of the many examples of protest arts that uh, has been on the street. I mean, like I call them protest art now because like it's tried to be politically easier to understand because like uh, the word the word propaganda is a little bit like um, uh, kind of kind of misunderstood these days, but. Uh, well, during the protests, like you will see all this kind of drawings or illustration that uh, will be like perpetrated in on the street of Hong Kong, like all, all, almost like every corner, and also flooded on the internet. Um, the protest art is like uh, well, because like a lot, like everyone in Hong Kong is like really care about what's going on uh, in that time. So like 
also a lot of like illustrator artists, like they have the skills of drawing. So, you know, um, the way that they can create put this art is there are many, many function. Uh, sometimes it's for healing and, and supporting people. Sometimes it's for sort of dirty. Sometimes it's for uh, education. Sometimes is for uh, sharing information and all. And even there will be like timeline of protests. Like, you know, at that time we are so, it's kind of exaggerated, like it's kind of crazy because we have like a monthly schedule of like what kind of things we can do every day pretty much. So like there will be artists like creating that kind of timetable for us. So what, what's really important in this, um, in this uh, uh, movement uh, is that the protest art really function in a way that's like help uh, help us to communicate and also support each other and gaining information and or and it's amazingly how the quality of the protest art uh, uh, can be seen as well. It, I mean, like before, I, I have to tell you the truth. Like before, um, like this movement, like you know, a, a lot of time I, I've never thought of like Hong Kongers have been, like how many so many very talented Hong Kongers can can create so so many stunning images. Uh, so uh, I was really impressed by a lot of things. Um, but at the same time, uh, you can see it's because the scenario that was really striking. It is very uh, like uh, uh, impactful. So that's really inspired artists to to create a, a lot of a lot of this kind of work. And slowly, uh, little by little, when you are start uh, seeing more and more this thing happen, uh, you you can start seeing actually some 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 part. Like I actually talked with some protest artists before, and they were saying that like a certain point, what they draw was actually starting to become. Uh, some of their uh, statement or strategy for for the movement because there are more people following particular artists. So what they draw was actually become something that kind of driving the movement. So at the, a certain point, they will be starting to be very careful about their action, careful about what they draw as well. And there's a lot of many different levels, for example, like uh, the protest art starting to combine with what we so-called ye yellow economic circle that we kind of start like generating like sustainability uh, and resources for, for the protests as well. So there's like actually, we don't have time to talk about it too much, but even protest art itself is very multi-dimensional uh, in this movement. Thank you. Thank you, Jill and Eric, for sharing some insights. And we'll come back to the protest art later when we talk about what visions are artists also uh, talking about and are artists mm. um, um, painting and making up uh, through their art. I want to move a, a little bit west now for the next um, next panelist, Olia. Um, Belarus. This is an image from the People's March in Minsk on October 25th, and Belarus has seen the largest anti-governmental protests in its history in the past month. Olia, can you give us a brief overview on the protests in your home country and how you have experienced them? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for invitation. I'm happy to par be part of this uh, group now. Uh, so uh, that's true. The, uh, now the protests, anti-governmental protests, are um, the most massive in the history, but there have been many protests before. And uh, with the current president who has been in power for 26 years, uh, uh, these years have been accompanied uh, by numerous political repressions. Uh, he changed the constitution. There have been political kidnappings and murders, falsified elections. And uh, uh, so there were regular protests, normally uh, against elections or some unpopular economic laws. Uh, but this year was uh, different uh, in a way that um, a lot of people uh, were mobilized uh, much more than before. And uh, the current uh, like spike of protests have been triggered by the uh, 9th of August uh, president elections. Uh, a record number of people actually showed up for voting before they have been mostly boycotted uh, by the people. And uh, the um, election campaign was very unexpected instead of uh, like traditional kind of opposition, uh, anti Lukashenko opposition, there have been totally new uh, candidates, which I don't think still that they represented really uh, the desires of all the populations who were against the government, but there were these candidates 
uh, of the protest against the government. Uh, and they managed, uh, even though many of them have been in prison, still they've been a united team of uh, candidates who managed to mobilize a lot of people. And a lot of people showed up for the elections and the falsifications were very obvious. Uh, also, there has been a lot of self-organized uh, initiatives and uh, newly created digital platforms uh, for alternative counter vote, for example, for self-organizing observers for the elections and so on. And also COVID crisis played a huge role because it was basically denied by the government. And instead of that, people also created self-organized networks to help, for example, doctors to buy uh, their protective equipment. Uh, and the demands basically were resignation of the government, new fair elections, freedom for political prisoners and to the stop of police violence. And uh, this, uh, the first night of protest have been followed by extreme police violence uh, Thousands of people have been arrested in the few days and the uh, population of the country is just 10 million. So it's a uh, big numbers. Uh, there have been tortures. Uh, there have been several deaths. Uh, so the, the protest is still continuing. It takes uh, different forms. There are different marches, like uh, this image which we just showed is a regular Sunday march, but there are also smaller marches of women, for example, of the retired, of different groups of, of people with disabilities. Uh, there have been massive strikes in all professional groups, basically, apart from the police. Uh, there have been different solidarity actions, uh, students mobilized, uh, like in the city, there has been uh, graffitis and flags everywhere. And there have been a big movement of self-organization in the yards and neighborhoods in the cities. Uh, and uh, it's also, I think, yeah, similar to Hong Kong situation in a way that is self-organized and leaderless. Even there is some political figures who are more, most public, they still do not represent the whole protest. And uh, in August, I was in Vienna, uh, and it was uh, with all the uh, travel restrictions and pandemic, it's not so easy now to move uh, across uh, the borders. Uh, so I was mostly following the first night through the media, through Telegram, and it was a very uh, complicated uh, experience of, of being safe, of course, but also uh, of being um, consuming a lot of this very violent uh, media footage uh, while the internet has been off, for example, in Belarus for the few days. Uh, and so it made me think also, what does it mean to participate, how to help uh, on the distance uh, and so on. Thanks. And while in the beginning, as I understand, there was a lot of hope that as soon as um, massive amounts of people would would gather on the streets, that the um, that things would change. Uh, but the protests have been lasting for over a hundred days. Um, and you wrote an essay for the magazine that we're going to publish. And in this essay, you uh, write this one sentence: "The future that keeps coming but never arrives." a stuttering future in its constant anticipation. Um, what do you mean by this sentence? Can you elaborate a bit on that? And what is the, the future that, that people are anticipating? Uh, yeah, thank you. This particular sentence was actually referring to the idea of post-socialism, uh, uh, which I also write further on the text. Uh, like kind of this promise of the uh, new historical moment, which still being uh, marked by the past. Uh, but there is suddenly some uh, difficulty speaking of about in speaking about the future now in Belarus. First, of course, because uh, what if the uh, system will not change? Uh, then the future will be super dark and very repressive. On the other hand, the present moment is so intense and it demands immediate action from you. So there is often no time and no energy to have any future agenda. And uh, also because anyone uh, who is seen by the lead as the leader by the state is uh, in danger to be imprisoned. So um, there is a com complica um, it's complicated to find any space or channel to voice uh, this future agenda of a very decentralized protest. Um, but uh, so far the future is rather uh, seen through negation, like the one uh, which has been uh, stated uh, about, so the future without the current government basically, uh, but also, and it's, um, I'm quite critical about this perspective from the West as seen uh, any uh, demonstration which uh, any protest which happens outside of the West is being seen as catching up revolutions 
so to say, like catching up for the uh, Western democracy and, and capitalism. Uh, so it's important to say that the current agenda is not exactly like pro-European and, uh, and not exactly like anti-Russian. Of course, people see that uh, Russia is supporting the government and basically it been able to keep for so many years because it's supported by Russia, but also you has been very comfortable about uh, the political situation in Belarus. So people are also skeptical about both you and Russia's role. And but for sure, people are uh, seeing uh, the more horizontal future uh, because uh, so many uh, networks and platforms and group have been uh, active and uh, so many different groups and uh, individuals finally acquired political agency. So uh, it's uh, not purely anarchist future, but it's definitely more self-organized. And um, that's why also I'm see, uh, saying in the article that it's important not to undermine the present moment as the present moment itself already uh, is part of the future. Yeah, and you also say that by moving, by mourning, by exhausting, by refusing, by celebrating together, that's also a way of synchronously rehearsing and, and exercising the future, right? So being part of this movement is exercising, rehearsing the future. Do you want to elaborate on that a bit? Um, Yeah, here I'm referring to exercise both as practice, but uh, uh, as a practice which is both uh, about uh, training, but also a practice of implementation and actually uh, enacting uh, something. Um, and um, I really love this quote about uh, dance scholar Andrea Lepecki in his text Core Police and Core Politics, when he says that the political movement, uh, I quote, must be learned, rehearsed, practiced, and experienced again and again and again and again, and in every repetition, through every repetition, renewed. And here there is this kind of double meaning of the political movement as the bodily movement, and also the um, political movement as such. And then Belarusian uh, prote in protest temporality of, uh, of Belarusian protests, there has been also this temporality of every day uh, that we protest every day. And people were often chanting like every day, every day. Uh, um, and, but at the same time, apart from this continuity, uh, the, the notion of stillness and interruption or rupture is very important. And here I refer to the mass strike movement. Um, And uh, also I was referring to the notion of um, perfagorative uh, politics, which I know can be criticized also, uh, but still I, uh, I think that uh, it's not only about rehearsing the future or like trying out the future, but actually the present moment can uh, contain in its uh, like intensities, endurance, uh, in its break, uh, which is not exactly uh, in between and here I refer to Isabel uh, Laurie, that it is already part of this um, futurity uh, because all these uh, networks that have been uh, built through this very exhausting, never-ending protest uh, are very important. And here this like kind of uh, long slowness is actually making, uh, uh, in this uh, sense, like time is our comrade, uh, we, we are exhausted, but also the police are exhausted and we have time to build structures because people don't learn to self-organize in one day. And uh, also I would like to mention here, uh, Tina Kamp, uh, a black feminist scholar who is writing about uh, racialized violence and black futurity. And her vision of uh, prefigurative politics is also considered, uh, is also uh, latent by the fact that uh, future must be, uh, lived now because uh, it is it might be endangered uh, and there is no time to wait like to uh, think okay maybe in the future uh, we will have this and this but uh, uh, when you're facing like extreme violence and danger uh, it is uh, like the present moment has this very powerful uh, futuristic uh, power I think. Thanks, so many rich uh, thoughts. I would like to come back to some of them later. And I would also encourage people who are listening to us on, on YouTube right now, um, they can ask questions in the chat and we'll uh, come back to them uh, just in a minute. Um, but we've, before we dive into the futures part, uh, I want to invite 
Abia. Abia um, grew up in the Lebanon and has lived there for a long time, is currently based in uh, Berlin. And Abia, the Lebanon, has seen several crises uh, throughout the, the past years, and we probably don't have enough time to, to talk about the majority of them. But can you can you give us a brief overview on what the situation is like right now in Lebanon? I know that not only your family lives there, but you also have a lot of friends there and are closely in touch with local communities. So what is the situation right now and, and what has led to this situation? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, for sure, we don't have time to talk about what's wrong uh, in Lebanon. I think we need years. <laughs> Uh, to first understand it and then process it. But quickly, or like a quick timeline of things, uh, from 75, 1975 to 1991, we've had civil, a civil war, right? And um, thousands and thousands of people dead, uh, they disappeared. And uh, the, well, I would personally call them warlords, but the people in charge, of different uh, political, different sects. So Lebanon is a tiny country. We're four million, um, and we have eighteen recognized religious communities. And for every religious community, there's a leader, and all of them took part in the war. And then after the war is over, they all assumed governmental positions, whether president or vice president or you know parliament members, etc. And they kind of like maintain their grip on things. Uh, there's no arms and shooting anymore. And it is a new system that was born that is born out of a uh, bloody war and um, thrived through corruption and uh, what we call like the patronage system where every leader takes care only of those who belong to his party or his sect in legal or illegal means. Um, we have, we are like, we're very, very corrupt. The country, the government, uh, there's no trust whatsoever in any official body, in any, uh, in the police, um, in anything that kind of like is part of the infrastructure of the country. And I say infrastructure and like, there's no infrastructure whatsoever. For it. Okay, forward 10, 15 years, same people are still there, same problems. Now, um, you know, the system is kind of like exploding because corruption cannot fix itself. It only, like things get only more corrupt, right? Um, after the Arab Spring, we didn't like other countries, we were a bit jealous of other countries. We didn't really take part like in the 2011, 2012 kind of movements. But then, um, cue the trash crisis in 2015. And we've seen for the first time, like, uh, like somehow, oh, protests that are not of one color or of one religion or of one, you know, idea or ideology. Um, but these protests soon withered because it was very, very centralized. It was in the capital. It was also kind of like, hogged by um, an elitist discourse. Um, a couple of years down the line brings us to 2019, 2020. Uh, economic situation is really bad. Unemployment is really, unemployment is really high. Um, a lot of external foreign powers, they have a say in our internal politics. And then uh, kind of like the, the straw that broke the camel's back is they introduced a tax attacks on WhatsApp, WhatsApp tax, right? And people flipped, they went crazy. They're like, no, and they took to the streets. Of course, it, wasn't, it was not a WhatsApp revolution, of course. Um, it was the last thing, like they took everything from the people and now they're gonna take like the only thing that, you know, it was something like that. And uh, starting October 17, people took to the street. And the difference was, it was all over the country. Everybody from south to north, everybody was protesting. Nobody told anybody what to do. There wasn't one leader, uh, which I think at, at the end we'll see that was also a problem. Uh, but people kind of like 
kind of shook a bit the fear of saying no to the leader or no to the system that has been taking care of them, basically, because there's no infrastructure in the country. There's no, if you're sick, the government cannot take care of you. You know, there's no social security infrastructure that will help you get better. You go to the person you vote for or that you get paid to vote for to get better or find a job or get your kid into university. So they they created the system where you you have to need them. Otherwise, you will starve or you will die or you will, you know. Um, so this is what happened. Uh, the protest where the I've never seen anything like it before in Lebanon. Um, everybody was on the street. People were not scared. The discourse was of a different level. Um, there were like social demands, intersectional demands, feminist demands, um, marginalized communities in Lebanon, such as the LGBTQ, uh, were occupied space. Uh, migrant and domestic workers were also kind of like found a space for them um, on the street. And we've never seen anything like that, never, ever. And it was really like this, oh my God, it might really happen. We're, we might actually topple something and things might change and things can get better. Of course, the protests were violent. The police kind of like attacked protesters. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, they tried every tactic in the book. Um, people would go on TV and be like, oh, the civil war is going to come back. So there's always this like big scarecrow that's the civil war, right? And, but people didn't, like, they didn't, yeah, they were faced, like, they, I don't care, we're on the street, we're going to stay on the street. And people did that, they stayed, they slept on the street. Um, but then another crisis hit, well, globally, which is um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the government or, you know, those in charge in Lebanon took this as this, like, their, it was, it saved them, basically, because a lockdown was forced, no more protests. Um, no more assembly, no more organization, no more people meeting anyone. And they were like, okay, this is how we're going to buy time. And this is how we're going to try and like agree between us, how we're going to like kind of like make them shut up the people. Um, and then they didn't apparently agree <laughs> because of so many things, including external interference. And now we're faced with <clears throat> a situation where our economy suffers 400% inflation. We're like second after Venezuela. Um, we have zero infrastructure. The pandemic is really like, we're doing really bad from a COVID perspective. People don't have money. People don't have food. Um, people lost all their savings. Like uh, the banks, the bank system collapsed. And... Um, Lebanese people are known to like, they work, they save, they put in the bank because the interest rate was very high, which is another indicator of how bad our economic situation was. But then the government was like, or the banks were like, we're sorry, we're out of dollars and all your accounts are now, if you want, confiscated. So you have a whole population that doesn't have access to its money anymore. Um, then you think about students abroad that no longer can afford paying because their parents cannot transfer the money. Um, people who are retired and that's their only source of income, it's gone. Like people's life savings are gone. And yeah, and now I think um, we have the saying in Lebanon that says uh, we're still alive because there is not enough death going around. And that's the that's situation right now. Like people are still alive because there's not enough death going around. Um, yeah, sorry for the, <laughs> it's very sad, but it's, no. it's true. Th thank you for sharing, Abia. And I know that you've been working with uh, LGBTQI communities in Lebanon. So how are these very vulnerable communities coping with the current uh, situation? Do you have some, some insights there that you can share? Or you also shared a picture yeah. with me uh, that I can show. Um, if you can briefly tell us what we can see on there maybe as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is, I love this picture because um, it's a kind of like, a, I was introduced to the word like a block in a protest when I first moved to Berlin, like you would have different blocks in protest. And I would call this the feminist block in the Lebanese protest. 
And uh, during this, these protests, the October 17 protests, the, the feminists, the feminist and the kind of like LGBT community really took lead in writing chants, expressing their demands in a very, very creative way to the point that it actually, everybody would repeat after them. And like you would have, um, yeah, people like you would have men um, that are pretty much, very much homophobic. They would chant after women saying, calling someone gay is not a slur, for example. And people like when I first heard that, we actually did turn and be like, oh, they didn't scream at us or yell at us or boo us. They actually are okay with what we're saying. And we saw this as an opportunity to kind of occupy more space and use it as a tactic or a technique to um, spread the kind of like the, or simplify the messaging and kind of like spread this kind of, feminist intersectional values in, um, in what was happening because the protest wasn't, it's not just a political thing. It's not just economical. It's not, it's everything. And um, for the first time, we were not hearing things like, oh, no, it's not time for women's rights. Or no, of course not. It's not time for LGBT people, right? So everybody had their, had a space and it was shared and it was beautiful. And you haven't seen, we have never seen that before. Now, if I want to go back to your question about how the LGBT community is kind of like coping, not good, I would say, but there is like, it's, it's um, community support. It's other people supporting other people because, um, and that's what, how it has always been in Lebanon. It is um, before, after the trash crisis and before the protest, we have a, we had a, I don't know, it's just a bad year, I think. We had a series of terrible fires, right? Fires. Who should put out a fire in a country? Normally the government, the foyave, or I don't know, someone who's like have trucks and stuff. That was, they weren't there. Nobody was there. So the people took care of the people. The people opened other people's, their home to other people. So they're doing the same right now in this current crisis. So you see um, slightly, like slightly better off uh, individuals opening their house, turning them into safe spaces for um, trans folks that, because of the economic crisis, were laid off. Because of the explosion, the where they were working, it just got destroyed. Um, uh, people who couldn't go back live, to live with their families because of their sexuality, they were like sheltered in just organization. They just transformed their offices and made them into safe spaces and um, external support, right? So like me, there's million others living outside of Lebanon, but we still have this like love, hate, relationship, and ties towards it. So we tried to do whatever we can to basically send money because that was what is needed. Um, not just talking about what's happening. A lot of people were talking, but the fact that I would say thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars were raised by individuals and shared with individuals within the country, not through organizations, not through big organizations, because also in Lebanon, um, we still have a clause that criminalize being uh, gay, right? So even if big organization cut lots and lots of funding, the last people that they will look at, if they do ever look at it, are LGBT communities, trans folks, and domestic and migrant workers. So we kind of like the feminist groups outside, kind of like we channeled our efforts to just raising funds for these groups of people. And it's slowly getting better. I mean, it's not getting better, but it's working. Um, people are not on the street as in because of everything, but the conversation is still happening. Thanks, Abia. And when I hear these, um, not only stories, but what, what is happening uh, in Lebanon, I'm also wondering how are people coping? What are coping mechanisms? And that brings me um, to a project that you started earlier this year called Hammam Radio, because um, you mentioned that it was a coping mechanism for you and for the, for the community. Um, so I was wondering if you 
if you wanted to give us a brief um, yeah, intro to what Hammam Radio is, um, to also see if this is something that could be deployed elsewhere or that other people could join. Um. Absolutely. I mean, um, so it was a coping mechanism for the lockdown, right? Um, I mean, I don't think all, any of us have ever experienced a pandemic before. I think this is, my, personally, this is my first pandemic experience. I hope it will be my last. Um, and all of a sudden, I found myself stuck, right? Like in, in every possible definition of the word, we, I was stuck. And uh, people back home were also stuck, more than me. Uh, but uh, they started um, public radio. They started a community radio. It was called uh, Radio Hai, the neighborhood radio, the third translation. And uh, Majd, our friend who started, who started it, reached out to me and be like, would you like to have a segment, talk about whatever you want? And uh, it was a beautiful way of just connecting with everybody back home at the same time. All of them who just, they just have to tune in and we would just talk at the same time. It was unprepared, unprofessional in the sense of I'm talking to you right now from my, like, my little home office. The same is my radio setup. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not a journalist, I can do radio, but it was something very, very natural and it was also very empowering. So that literally the next day, um, I reached out to a couple of friends and I was like, we need to start our own radio and we need it to be a feminist radio. And that's it, like, we need to talk about, like, this is it, this is what we need. And this is actually what people needed a space, especially women, marginalized group, LGBT community, non-binary folks, they needed a space to talk that is public, right? So kind of like reclaim all the spaces that they know they now no longer have access to because of the corruption, because of the explosion, because of they don't have money to go to a bar to buy a beer or a tea to kind of like talk. And because their community centers are now safe spaces. So Everything is gone, basically, or transformed. And we did that. And it started uh, with a group of people here, uh, me in Berlin, uh, Rasha's in Amsterdam, Palestine, Lebanon, and Geneva. And um, it was very, very organic. And the idea was, we're going through something we've never been through before, uh, even people who are 10 or 20 years older than us. Um, we need kind of like a space for women's voices, for LGBT people voices, without the G actually. Uh, and um, we're gonna give them that space. Nobody's gonna give us that space. So we're just gonna create it and we're gonna offer it to anybody who wants. And I think this was the catch. People from, or women um, from Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, um, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, um, Western Sahara, Tunisia, and of course a bit uh, in Europe, like Berlin and Geneva and Spain and the US actually, we're like, we want a slot and we want to talk about our stuff. And that's what happened. We're now, um, uh, it's still going, we're on like, and it's a, the community is growing. And um, what started as a coping mechanism became kind of like a healing thing. Like it was collective therapy, but it was, Beautiful. It wasn't triggering. It wasn't traumatizing. Um, yeah. Thanks. And and this is a good segue into the futures part, because while you were talking, Abir, one could really see, and I hope the others saw that as well, when you were talking about the Hammam radio project and uh, about a possible futures out there and how people are connecting, we could see that in your posture also in your, in your voice. So I want to use this segue to move us all into the futures part and to discuss um, what makes you and your communities hopeful, but also maybe let's Let's kick us uh, off with the question, um, since Abia already mentioned that, what are new forms of collaboration and solidarity that you saw? And I know that in Hong Kong, there's this saying or this notion of climbing the mountain together. So Joel and Eric, what surprised you maybe? What collaborations or what solidarity or what are some things that you, um, that you can, some insights that you have there? Or what does this even mean, climbing the mountain together? Oh, 
Um, well, climbing the mountain uh, in your own way, I guess, or yeah, uh, in different directions, something like that. It's like a saying that developed by like the like Hong Kong people by the community by the protester themselves. It's just it's also pretty much with like the people or the theory basically because what we're saying that like you know basically there is a very clear like a common core value that we want to protect and we want to uh, 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 defend um, uh, in Hong Kong. And since everybody has this like same like agreement, uh, but then everyone can interpret it and you know uh, see it in a very different way, and also in line with their own skills and capability, and to see what they can contribute and support in the movement. So that's uh, what we means like climbing the mountain from like all different way. Like, you know, I can, I can climb this mountain. If I'm an artist, I can climb this mountain by my creative capability. If I'm a businessman, I can like try to start my yellow economic, economy circle means that like the pro-democracy uh, businesses uh, to, to try to support the protester. If I don't want to go to the front line, I can go up the back and, you know, like, like kind of like supporting the post, uh, giving resources to the protester. Or if I, if I think I am capable, I have nothing to lose, I want to contribute on the front line, there will be front line or like fighting on the front line. So, um, so uh, that's, that's why, you know, everybody can really do something in this movement. And this is how the leaders and decentralization works uh, in that sense. Um, in terms of like, what is our solidarity system in Hong Kong? I mean, um, I don't know, uh, it's get to a point that it's really abstract to me, like after a, a, a while, I mean, like maybe, when we are in a moment of time of last year, we can very easily tell like, because we're angry, because we are feeling that like, you know, we like there's part of ourselves being taken uh, by, the, by, by, by the authority and we have no power or any possibility to fight back and we just have to do whatever we could. Uh, the core value that we all treasure has generated a lot of common like sympathy or empathy from each other. Like when 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 we're talking about like in Belarus and also um, in Lebron, like all this support system that generating from from uh, like the occasion because like people are suffering. Um, this this is just like people are like feeling the same thing. And, and, and all of a sudden, like Hong Kong is a city that's everyone just helping each other. There's no self, you know, it's all about others. You know, in, in, on the street, you can see people like distributing like food ticket to others, like in the train station, you don't even need to buy a ticket. You know, you get in, you, there will be money on top of the ticket machine for the protester to, to, to buy a ticket, for example. That kind of scene was like super touching at the time when I was looking at it. But like, you know, that was like last year, right? But like now, I mean, like when you were, it's like particularly in these days, this week is terrible in Hong Kong because, you know, the regime again, like, like you know, like for example, like three, three very um, kind of more like uh, uh, iconic figures in Hong Kong was like the young protester, like Joseph Wong and and at a child and one more uh, in a group was been arrested like no, no they were arrested they prosecuted and they're on the court and now they are in prison already so uh like you know it's a big shock uh so you know we are kind of if we talk about now the present time we are like in a moment of time that we we're really searching for our own like a new way of of like cute like basically like to sustain ourselves, and also there's a lot of question how this movement can move on. Uh, so, um, like we need to, we we need to kind of like. But then the the, the funny, the, the craziest part is that Hong Kongers they would never give up. You know, a lot of people ask like why Hong Kongers has this devotion, why they're so like you know so 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 devoted to this movement. I was always saying that like, you know. Um, 
Hong Kong, this is just like our this is something that we we feel very different from 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 the the mainland in for example i mean um we think you know hong kongers have their own history and then we have something that is very important to us and you know this past year it's just having having a very painful time that you know it's just like feeling part of your heart has been taken so you know and we are we this is just like hong kongers characteristic that you know we are not gonna let that happen we just like fight to the end uh we we, we try for all different sort of ways so uh what i can see in the dance side in the sad side you know or the negative side we are kind of undergo a very tough very very tough situation right now but uh, at the same time you know since we have this energy still within us I know that you know uh, there always be something we do. Uh, even Joshua Wong, when she when he entered the prison, the last thing that he said, we said like we still have things to do. We still have ways to to, to move on. So just don't give up. Just continue on. So I guess you know that I I I, I it's hard to answer the question about how <laughs> how the solidarity system can happen right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, but there is there are some. Maybe maybe staying there yeah Joel, and looking at the future i was just about to ask if you wanted to to add something um please go ahead well uh honestly just like eric said we are in a very difficult situations you know since the COVID 19 situations uh lots of protests and gathering assemblies are being cancelled due to the new legal system for example it's illegal to have more than four people outside together uh, for over, I guess, five to six months already. And then, and then a lot of people questioning where the movement goes. And uh, of course, we are all really confused, you know, right after the national security law. Uh, but I guess creative practitioner really, really did a great job on that. You see that there are loads of um, creative productions afterwards, including independent production of film, documentaries, um, nowadays, distribute internationally about the Hong Kong protest situations and then to arouse people to, you know, watch us uh, for knowing what's going on exactly here. And then all the international media coverage uh, relates to Hong Kong. And then that's why we said that, you know, different people, we have the same belief, climbing the same mountain by your own means. So, you know, whoever we are, Oppositional political leaders, but now, of course, it is much more um, overarching. And uh, as I said, um, there have been uh, massive strikes uh, in all uh, spheres. And maybe you can show the poster which I uh, send you now, uh, which we've done with a, a collective which I'm part of, um, work hard, play hard, working group together with. Uh, Dina Zhuk, yeah, this one, uh, Nicolas Pisivtsev and uh, Alexey Borisonek in support uh, 
of the uh, general strike. Uh, so there have been different gestures of uh, solidarity. We made, for example, this set of posters, but also being uh, physically in Minsk and just uh, taking part in uh, all the actions as uh, not being like part, uh, not as artists or any professionals, but just as uh, general citizens. Oh, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, this was, um, there are also numerous volunteer networks, uh, people who are, for example, despite the total uh, erosion of any legal system, uh, like now no laws are actually being followed. Uh, today, there have been like 30,000 uh, detentions uh, in this uh, like three months and no, uh, like hundreds of criminal cases against protesters, but not a single criminal case against tortures and even deaths. Uh, but still there are a lot of um, people who try to uh, help people uh, with any legal uh, advice or any uh, yeah, legal procedures. Also, there have been volunteer networks uh, around detention centers, for example. And uh, also a lot of funds have been created to support, uh, to collect money for the victims of violence, but also people on strike who have been fired. Uh, and uh, also it, uh, I, when, when, I, when I was talking to Abir, um, in Belarus also, uh, it's quite a homophobic uh, society, but of course there have been like uh, uh, many uh, active LGBTQ activists and group groups and now they have been also very actively involved in the protest so we ne we like never had a proper uh, like uh, manifestation like no pride uh, maybe i think it was once but uh, it was of course suppressed and it was crazy to see now like rainbow flags as part of the demonstration so this moment gave like a lot of visibility to uh, all different marginalized groups but of course it's not so idealistic and still the problems are there and they must be addressed uh, on a long perspective um yeah and also i think uh, it's important that people both learned how to solidarize within their professional groups for example doctors but also all these solidarity networks have been uh, like cross professional like uh, it workers supporting industrial workers for example uh, retired people have been supporting students uh, and so on and also it was important that people within state institutions uh, which are normally very conservative ones and state uh, uh, universities are also being very uh, active part of the protest. For example, before there was this like kind of division uh, since Soviet Union that there is a official uh, art uh, scene and non-official like dissident art scene. And now uh, in this situation, it's much more mixed and uh, much more complicated. It has always been, but now it's more visible. Uh, and also like another very important last thing I will say that Minsk, the capital of Belarus is very centralized. It's like the center and then there are these sleeping districts uh, which are not so active. Uh, but now because the government, uh, the police really tried to block the center of the city from the protesters, they pushed the protest to the neighborhood. And eventually people really started to self organize in these uh, sleeping districts. Uh, they have meetings like different protest actions there but also just concerts and a lot of like festive events which are now of course harder when it's colder and uh, telegram was an important platform in that sense that people had this numerous telegram chats but of course it's also very dangerous because uh, like there have been a lot of arrest of uh, administrators of these uh, channels and so on and maybe this uh, telegraph that you just mentioned, the uh, technology is a good way to um, to move over to uh, some questions from the audience, because there's a whole list of them. Uh, and I wanted to ask Martina if she, um, yeah, if she would ask us some of the things that came up in YouTube, because some of them also refer to technology and to decentralization, right, Martina? Uh, yes, yes, I'll just... Um briefly mention a couple of those uh, questions. That's been a really engaging uh, debate and commentary on YouTube, which is really exciting to see. And I'll just read out a couple of the questions. So first one is, how will the monopoly of big tech businesses and governments backed by big tech companies transform civic participation protest and also art in the long term? That would be the first one. I'll post the questions quickly in our Zoom chat as well, so you can read up on them. The second one, 
Should and could protest be the birthplace of new decentralized platforms? Third, how do we create safe digital civic spaces? What do movements need? And perhaps the fourth one that I would take up was uh, from Marta about whether the real challenge is then the protests and fighting injustice takes up all the energy. So there's hardly any resources left to develop visions for what comes after and whether this is the role of the arts to not lose track of the bigger picture. So I will so, post them into the Zoom chat for all the panelists to have another look at the questions and uh, Julia, perhaps for you to um, uh, to pass the questions on to the panelists. Sure. So why don't we start with the technology part and then go into this last question that I think is very interesting. Um, everyone uh, can talk about this one. Um, the technology part, because uh, we've seen that people in, in Hong Kong like used several different platforms in Belarus, as Olya mentioned, uh, Telegram was an important uh, platform. Abia is working in this field and training people on how to protect themselves better. Um, so who wants to who wants to address or talk about the, the technology questions that we just heard? Um, what are new tools that we maybe need in order for um, civil society to organize better and safer? I can start. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think uh, there is this kind of like agreement somehow that these what we still calling big tech companies are not going anywhere, right? And um, <clears throat> from the Lebanese context, we've seen that uh, there wasn't much resistance into using them, like as in using Facebook and using, actually the, the, the star is Instagram, amazingly. Um, there is kind of, there was two, two things. People want to be safe when they plan and organize. And then here, you know, there's all these like, safe communication channels, as in encrypted, as in signal, wire, and kind of like now even WhatsApp. Um, and the other part that they wanted to kind of work on is archiving, but also kind of mobilizing. And Instagram was, was the, the go-to. Uh, you see now um, in the Lebanese kind of like Insta sphere, um, queer groups, feminist groups, anti-corruption groups, uh, they kind of redefined or like re, yeah, they redefined what Instagram is there for. It's no longer the safe, happy, oh no, niche safe, it's a safe. The happy, you know, scrolling down cupcakes and hashtag blessed life and you know, all of that. And now it is this place where um, some accounts are actually posting uh, people, uh, asking people to just send them, made, they made everybody the account handler in the sense of, you see a politician somewhere, are they eating? Take a photo, let us know where it is. We're gonna ask people to, we're just gonna add the location and we're gonna ask people to go there. Um, are they traveling? Are they in Paris? Are they in Switzerland? Did they buy a new home there? Did you see them shopping? Send us a photo, we sent people there, like kind of like to, and, all of a sudden, you're no longer one account. You're like, you're not only, you manage the account, everybody with you manages this account. And it worked. And people uh, are, are I, don't wanna even, I don't wanna say scared, but they don't wanna be featured on their account. So they either lay low or they kind of like take positions that they're no longer, like they change their positions. Another big uh, impact it had is we've had in the past two months, uh, student election in all of the yeah, universities in Lebanon. And there was two accounts that they took up upon themselves to, uh, if I want to say out, out the politician, uh, the students that pretended to be independent to get the votes because now everybody wants to vote independent and nobody want to vote for political groups. They just went through their Instagram historically, through their tagged photos and be like, you're saying you're independent? Here you are saying you belong to this party or stuff like that. And it did change. And for the first time in Lebanon, student election history, independence 
won the majority of the election seats in all of the universities. And this, like, this is amazing. So, so just from a Lebanese context, it was that. And if you want to talk about Hammam Radio, that we do only exist like on the website, Hammam Radio, to hear the streaming, and also on Instagram. And it's a growing community, and it is a safe space. It's an open public safe space, just because from the moment we started, there was like no tolerance for any kind of hate speech, and I won't even talk to you. You're automatically going to be blocked and banned or uh, shamed and blocked and banned. So you're like, everybody is going to teach someone else a lesson. And um, you see this um, solidarity as if these accounts have their own mind and they live somewhere and they're all like BFFs together and they defend each other. And I found it amazing, right? Like you take something that had, uh, I mean, Facebook had a very specific plan for Instagram. We want to use it to create influencers and you know, sell br and brands and sell ads and do that. And now it's being used as a tool to kind of like subvert everything that they wanted to do. And it's working. So, yeah, that's my two cents for this question. Anyone else wants to join in around the technology or also the digital literacy or the new platforms that we might want or need to see for these um, movements? I can talk a bit. Um, well, I mean, like Hong Kong Earth has been using tons and tons of like different technology, and it's not it's not about the technology is new or what. It's just the way how we use it is is amazing. Like you know, like how Joel mentioned about like like airdrop is one thing. There is a very different way of thinking how airdrop should function in 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 a, in a situation out there. Uh, but I think in general, I want to say, like, you, even though the question is about monopoly, but uh, like through this protest, I actually feel that um, like there is, uh, how can I say, like, even though if there is a uh, monopoly, but you can see there's still options around. And that's I also mentioned in the interview is that you know, we, if there's something wrong with certain technology, there's always something else that is, that is, uh, may fit the purpose of, of the protester. Like Telegram, for example, uh, it's, it's, it's have like a more like, uh, uh, more aware of the privacy and security, for example, and then we move to Signal and all other kind of non uh, monopoly um, uh, platform, which basically give me kind of like, some like a little bit more positive thinking, which is like, was actually, you know, um, with the technology today is the technology to me is more democratized today, actually, because like, like, you know, look at all the startups and or like cloud funding possibility, people can develop their own technology in, in many ways. So, uh, so what I want to say is there, I think in general, this creating like a more possibility for bottom up situation uh, uh, when when technology is more open and democratized, uh, even though, I mean, when there's option, when there is possibility of democratize and there's possibility for bottom up ex as well. For example, what I also mentioned last time was like, uh, in, like in the middle of our movement, um, there's a group of people that was like, okay, uh, during G20 in Osaka in Japan, uh, we want, like, they want to, like, uh, post internationally uh, the newspaper, uh, the global newspaper, uh, the front, the, 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 the full page uh, uh, newspaper ad of uh, uh, Stand with Hong Kong, supporting Hong Kong uh, during the June 20 date, basically. And, but it spent, a, it, it needs a lot of money, right? But if you imagine if someone have this idea in the past, it's impossible for to do that. But today, because of like the new technology, because of digital community, they actually crowdfund uh, to, to make this happen. So they put this idea online and within like one morning, they already reached the goal. And that was talking about like um, uh, six, to seven million Hong Kong dollar, which basically I don't, I don't not good at math, but it's a lot of money. So the in, uh, good enough to post like news on like thirteen or tw like twenty countries basically, and everything just happened in one day. You know they called action, they asked people to write the write the text and make the design and everything, and 
in and within few days they post the news in our country mm -hmm. basically. So so what I'm saying is how this how this like you know it doesn't matter how we utilize it. But it's if when we like now when people have think have the thinking have an idea, uh, especially for Hong Kongers' case, then they then we there's a possibility for us to look for a route to reach to that goal. Uh, another example we can put we can we can we can show is yellow economic circle. For example, I was been man mentioning this a few times because we were also mentioning how the movement can be long term. And and like in an economic the economic standpoint, try to less rely on uh, China per se. That uh, uh, in our economic economic system, the yellow economic system, the pro democracy economic system has arisen. It and uh, what technology plays plays within this 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 yellow economic circle. Uh, uh, community is that actually there are people that creating apps right away within weeks, like within days they create like a like an iPhone app or like a, like a like Android apps that you can just basically search online and see how many like where is the yellow shops that around you that you can go to like the the, the shops that is like minded you know they they the money that they earn they might donate back to the protester for example. So, you know, generating this ecosystem and like it's not single-handed technology play a role and the way how people think about yeah. how, how our system can be bottom up plays a role. So I think, I think this is something that I think is maybe is a hope, but again, of course, yeah, at the, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what interesting we can see as well is that we have the freedom to use this technology this day now in, in Hong Kong. But I also point out that last time is that look at China, like, you know, because we have the option to choose technology, but in China, there's none, right? Yeah. So like, if you need to use, like, if you want to use social media, there'll be only Weibo. Um, you know, if you want to use Messenger, there will be only WeChat. Um, there, there's only one telecommunication uh, 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 provider in in China. So, 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 Seeing that you're basically seeing the the, the 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 demographic is basically like you know like China is just try to block everything mm -hmm. so that everything is under control. But then the, the end of the day, if they put this to Hong Kong, that would be also uh, a, a possibility that everything would be shut down right away as well. So yeah. so we see the possibility and hope, but at the same time, we would know there is also something that we have to kind of tangle with, yeah. Thanks for the answers to this question. So I want to use, if, if nobody else wants to reply to the uh, technology question, or are there uh, other replies? Uh, yeah, Olia? maybe I okay. wanted to yeah, add yeah, go something. ahead. Yeah, yeah um, I was to say that uh, even though, um, like the fact that, um, now uh, a lot of people have access to telegram uh, which is good for self-organization but also for spreading information as before like the government could, could just block the oppositional newspaper and you don't have news uh, and even though in belarus there is quite good uh, like connection to internet and uh, good computer literacy still some people uh, like all the generations for example they don't access to it so then there is this uh, danger of uh, thinking that oh everyone knows like what's going on uh, but actually no and actually now there have been there is a par um, parallel to all these digital platforms they have been very old technique of just uh, making posters or leaflets with information and just sticking them in the space and also it was a very uh, like strange uh, and uh, i don't know maybe important moment when uh, during the first days of the protest the government really blocked the whole internet connection and they still block uh, mobile internet on sundays uh, so but it actually may created this effect that maybe people went to the streets instead of following what's going on online and uh, and it was more scary, but also maybe it helped the protest to decentralize because you really had to go out on the street to see what's happening. 
And then uh, when after the three days, the internet was back, there was a huge wave of these scenes of violence and torture, which also made people much more angry because they got all this information at the time. So uh, I think it's this kind of balance between absence, like, I don't know, limitation of technology and its absence and the importance of still like physical presence, uh, which is at play here. And also the question of anonymity is very important because on one hand, uh, people are now learning much more how to be anon anonymous online. But on the other side, they're trying to create technology to de-anonymize the police because the police are now almost every time they're wearing masks like balaclavas. Uh, so they can be identified, and I think this is a very necessary, like skill, how to de anonymize uh, the like the criminals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to end this panel with uh, the question that I think it was Marta uh, put in the chat about the role of artists. So when everyone is exhausted by protesting by the the crisis we're in, uh, how can artists is it the role of artists uh, she asks to not lose track of the bigger picture and i want to share a quote by Yusela Le Guin, which is kind of on the same note she she talks about capitalism she says we live in capitalism its power seems inescapable so did the divine right of kings any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings resistance and change often begin in art and very often in our art, the art of words. So I want to maybe ask each one of you what you think the role of artists uh, can be when it comes to developing visions for the future. And I want to start with you, Joel, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, well, um, just like what I said before, actually, artists and creative petitioners play a really important role during the whole movement, no matter about the protest arts or any incidents or, you know, making documentary, film, etc. All these productions is like, first of all, it's like um, retaining the history. We are all the witness. And then they always remind us um, our vision and our shared value and belief. And I guess all this, like, like, like myself, at the very beginning, I didn't know what to do as well. So that as a curator and researcher, I do archive. And then I didn't even know that at the very beginning, what will it turns out to be. It's just something that we believe that we should do. And then carry on until it's ready, timing is right with the distribute. And then we engage international you know, people together who share the same belief. And I believe that is what art could do as well. I guess so. <laughs> Thank you. Abia, do you wanna go next? Uh, yeah, from someone who is not artistic at all, I think um, we terribly, terribly need it. <clears throat> we need more. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that like, no matter how tired you are or how uh, helpless and hopeless you are, it's something that like, um, at least from what I've, it's a, it's a healing thing, right? Whether the production of it, it's, is it collective or not? The sharing of it, the <clears throat> just seeing yourself reflected in, I mean, even when I just saw the, the, the photos you projected of the Hong Kong uh, protest, well, yeah, I, I see Lebanon there, right? And it's it's just, we need that. We need more storytellers also. We just like it's not like everything is good, but we also need more of what makes us feel stuff and kind of like connect more, being vulnerable with each other and uh, an honest vulnerability, you know, not the one I you want to wait for the other to be like, oh, you're vulnerable, then you're weak. On the contrary, like you want to be able to feel that other people are also feeling. And it just makes us less lonely. Olia, you as an artist, what do what do you um, feel about this question? Or what are your thoughts around this? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
first actually it was really hard to do anything as an artist so to say because it felt like everyone should just mobilize as a just as a general public and contribute to the protest and also the energy and the creativity of a protest itself uh, seemed so much more powerful than any like contemporary art but now with time i also think that maybe the artist's contribution could be in actually creating this more long-term and reflexive uh, perspective of making sense of and what's going on because in this like very intensive effect it's very hard uh, to actually take a pause and to start analyzing things and also yeah I totally agree with this um, importance of storytelling but also I think the it's uh, we should not also like there was a question about resilience uh, techniques and I think joy is very important uh, and uh, it also really helps you to cope uh, with things and to create the shared space. Like, as I mentioned, uh, there have been like hundreds of self-organized concerts in the yards and and there are different, totally different uh, styles. And you don't also need to be like a professional musician. Uh, and it was really like the kind of parallel minister of culture, so to say, created like people were inviting like musicians to come and play music in their place. And uh, I think that was not less important than like going to protest because in this like very dark times, it's very important to also find uh, energy to actually be joyous. Thank you. Eric, over to you. We only have one minute left, I'm afraid. Uh, but you as an artist, um, what's your answer? Well, I guess like, you know, in our case of Hong Kong, like, you know, during the movement, art has been transforming and actually functioning in a very different way. But during this time right now, I mean, well, I think I mentioned also in the interview is that I think I see art very differently right now. Like one thing we can do as an artist is that we, because artists is not only about making art, it's also about their creative energy, their creative thinking, their art thinking. So one thing we can try to do more is to try to apply our art thinking, our creative thinking into what can be possibly happen in the future that one thing archiving is one thing storytelling as one thing keep keep the history going and it, the other thing i am kind of feeling that you know it is important for us to also kind of expand ourselves uh, to connect with the other world as well the Belarus and and everyone you know we all we all embrace the same core value that we care so what i what i find art could be interesting is that art will be able to transform um our belief together you know in a communication model in a communication tool it is a communication tool for us to connect for us to further on for us to agree for us to make believe make further move and if we can create this synergy that would be you know, what art can be empowered, I guess. Wow. I know that we could like discuss this endlessly. There's so many <laughs> more topics on, on my list, but uh, we're, we've run out of time. Um, I, I, I want to say thank you so much for, for joining us and for sharing insights, um, sharing strategies, but also sharing a lot of hope and um, new approaches that we now, um, that we can explore in the future. And uh, each of you has written an article or there's an interview coming up in the magazine that will launch on December uh, 15th um, on the Goethe Institute website and on the website of DING, which is dingdingding.org. So thank you to all of you. And also thank you to the audience who's been listening, who's been asking questions and uh, to the Goethe Institute for hosting us. And I'm just going to give over to uh, Martina for a final word, but thank you from my side. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks uh, to you, Julia from Superlab for hosting and, and sharing this amazing conversation. And thank you very much, of course, to our online audience who've been following us loyally for those last 90 minutes and those very engaging conversations in the chat. Um, we've posted in the YouTube chat, the um, websites where the digital publication will be published on the 15th of December. It would be wonderful to be able to reach out to you then via the websites. And um, I can only say um, thank you again for this very con engaging conversation and um, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, bye for now.
Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.